Hi, this is me, uh, Con Griffin, back here in Valley de Hall. I, when I was here 23 years ago, I was uh, called here by a few officials from the unveiling of Danam, Danamani's bronze statue. There was three celebrities picked to, um, to unveil that statue. The, Two people called to me in Ryland. It was uh, John Leavis was one. He was a great fan of uh, Dan O'Mahony, and uh, there was his friend with him. Both of them were suited and booted, and uh, knocked at my door in Ryland and said, "We'd like to speak to you. We, we heard about you and about your Guinness World Record with the uh, uh, 56 pound weights." and we also heard that you were a wrestler in London some years ago and uh, we're here to commemorate a great wrestler of 1932 which was uh, Dan O'Mahony who toured Ireland at that time and um, Steve Case wrestled all over the country so uh, I, I said of course but um, I had a gym that time in Ryland my own gym and I still have it there but at that particular time I had everything laid out up there I brought the two men upstairs to my gym and I got my 256 pound weights by Matt which was already in situ and uh, I just went down on my back to show him what I do and I just pumped out something like about 25 straight lifts of um, the Guinness World's record to show you know show them how I'd done it and I'd broken that record and got that record to Guinness from uh, Kilbane where I'd done it some about a year previous to that. Now we were just going into a time just two years before the millennium and there was foot and mouth in Ireland at that time. They left me and they were delighted they both shook hands with me and they said that I'd be invited to come here and there'd be four course meals laid on for myself, Bishop Buckley, and, uh, and Mick, um, Mick Barry, the famous bowl player. So we were to be the, the three men to, um, you know, to, to unveil the statue. And I was asked, would I do a show in the hall that, that, that evening? So all that was arranged. and. John Leavis had, I just remember what John Leavis said, he said, you picked in 56 pound weights and you made them look like two bags of feathers, he said. Uh, he said, no, no doubt, he said, I, I, I know what I was about and what I was doing. But, uh, of course, we all know now that um, country closed down shortly after and everything was arranged, they had everything set up here, we were ready to come. We had. Uh, Pat Lehan's bus hired, it was the bingo bus at that time, and uh, we were all set to go. But uh, we, ha we have, of course, then that what happened was, which is history now, uh, everything in Ireland was stopped. It's a bit like the thing we're in now, this uh, callback thing. So it's a bit like that. The whole country was closed down, so th it was cancelled and uh, it brought it back a bit closer to the millennium it brought it back an yet another uh, to, it would have been 1993 uh, 1988 or something like that just coming up or no not 1998 just coming up for the millennium and um, it, we got it back on again but we always said that uh, it wouldn't be as successful as it would have been if it went off in its original time but at that time I was still working with uh, Ryland in the, a boxing club I, I was the fitness coach and I used to call every night and most of the people like the two main uh, three main people that run uh, Ryland boxing club was Dan Lane um, Dan, Dan Lane John Crowley and um, and Mick the Yank Mick the Yank was the MC and he had agreed to, to come down here and do the MC for the show 
and um, so buses arrived arranged again yet again and we had a full bus was coming we had uh, John K uh, what was it? yeah he was um, Carey the, the accordion player and uh, Willie jo uh, what you call Mikey Joe uh, Mike, Mikey Joe Quinn his grand uncle of, of grand nephew of the bold Teddy Quill. So he was along a bit of a character, both of them bits of characters. Uh, Martin Carey and uh, the, the bus was full of people anyway, I was. So them are the two, them people are no longer with us now, they're passed on. So uh, only Mikey Joe's only gone this year earlier. So um, I didn't go, comes to mind anyway. But the bus was full and uh, my daughter Sharon went on the bus just to see them on and see them off the bus and um, of course as usual they had plenty of drinking and uh, we myself and Cathy had arrived earlier of course in our own car and um, we had the 256s in the back and I had my mat and uh, it was early in the day and there was still a huge crowd around here in Valley of You'd never think by looking at it as it is today that this place could ever get so busy. As we came to the bridge there was people everywhere and um, so we went to a, 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 a first of all because the restaurant wouldn't have been opened and there would have been no one there so we went to O'Brien's Bar and when we arrived at O'Brien's Bar there's a man behind the counter and he looked for all the world like Big Tom, like Big Tom, the, the showman. So this man, he, uh, he had a big uh, blonde he head on him, you know, and he was he was at least about maybe a couple of inches taller than Big Tom. But uh, we all agreed that he looked like Big Tom. Up on the wall, they had a, a poster, a, a picture, well, a framed picture of myself in the restaurant hall, you know, like a typical restaurant hall. And uh, there was another one, the Guinness World Record was, was up there too. And there was a lot of people coming and going and looking at the picture and looking at that and asking me questions and things about that, like about wrestling. And of course, John Leavis loved to talk about Dano and tell stories about how much he'd eat for his dinner, for instance. And the dinners that he had described to me and to other people were ridiculous. If he had ate that much, he would never have been able to climb up in the ring or a mind to uh, do any kind of activity. But uh, coming for a uh, dinner then in the evening, uh, we were all invited to go up to the restaurant and go in and take up our table. Myself and Cathy, we were the first people to be seated. They got us a nice table and a nice uh, place well, to, you know, open to uh, the people coming in. And then the first man to come to my table was Bishop Buckley. And he spoke to me for some time. And he said, um, Connie said, you're not in my diocese, he said. Well, that meant very little to me, not being a man of religion or anything like that and I, I'd been tough the years in England and had become quite anglified. So I, I, I didn't know how to get rid of this man, this man with a big long black frock on him and with a bit of mauve on it and all that kind of stuff. But anyway he finally did move away and I was quite happy when he did. But uh, then we had uh, Mick, Mick Barry came and he, he came around my table and had a chat with me and again it was the same kind of a handshake, it was much easier to, to, to me try to communicate with the bishop. But um, then I had uh, a fellow called Dean, uh, something, he was equipped to the bishop but only in the Church of Ireland and he had his lady wife with him and they came and I felt way better talking to him even though I haven't got his religion either, I'm not found, you know, bothered with any religion matter of fact but uh, he spoke to me and I found it much easier conversation and his lady wife spoke to me and shook my hand and wished me luck and all that 
and I told them stories about when I'd lived in London and where I'd been and where, and they seemed to be very uh, interested. But anyway, the night wore on and um, dinner was over and a lot of the waitress did they thought I was going to be an awful man for eating because I was a, a wrestler and I, I would eat them out of house and home. But to their surprise, of course, I could only eat like a church mouse. I could eat very little because uh, I am a type 1 diabetic and was then. So I had to be very careful of what I put into my mouth. And uh, anyway, the hall was packed when we went there about, um, uh, about well, it was about uh, 8 in the evening. And I was carrying my 56 one inch shot and I put them up on the stage in the place and I put down my mat and of course first of all there was a dance there the people were dancing and there was a great crack and great buzz about it some were drinking of course there was drink and everything but um, it, finally then Mick Diang fair play to him you know he's a great man an MC he got on the stage and he started to tell about Con Griffin and Con Griffin's life and where lived in London and all that. Now Mick himself was a UCC graduate, uh, he's a great character to talk and he becomes Father Christmas every uh, Christmas time. He puts on, a, a, he dons a big red coat with fluffs on it and he has the beard already, he doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to do about his weight either, his weight is just right. So uh, he, had, he was Get on, and John Leavis was at the other side and it was almost like you had two MCs so the whole thing was getting away from me I could see that because if you're two masters of ceremony it would be like having two ring masters in a circus you know they'd, they'd be all confused so I, I at finish John Leavis got fed up with it all and he said here let's get on with it anyway so that was my cue I was, I was to wait because every any man that ever put on an act, you have your your mark on the stage. You know where you're going to begin. I've known for years. I've watched men like Danny LaRue. I've watched uh, fellas, you know, great showmen that could put on a show and own the stage. So I knew I had to win back this stage. And how am I going to do this? I got two uh, masters of ceremony. <laughs> They're both having a almost like a tiff, like it's going. Who's, who's going to give that? So, I finally, anyway, I decided I'd take it on myself. I'd go in my own way. So, I went down, I went down in a deep squat. It was like that. I was much younger then, like that. And I bounced all the way to the middle of the stage. And when I got to the end in the middle, I done a circle like that. And then I swung and back like that to them, like that. And I won the crowd. The crowd, all of a sudden, I had them in my hand, so then I, I started to, you know, and, and then I went back like a, like a judo player would, and banged the two hands down, and then back for the weights, got hold of them, and pumped out something like about 28. The, the record uh, at that time, the record at that time was 27, so uh, the record was broke, and the crowd went mad, and uh, it was like when, when uh, that, uh, remember that uh, Italian 90, when Paki Bonner stopped the, 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 the penalty. It was like that. The crowd raced to the stage and the excitement was something else. The crowd was won and that was my first time at Ballet de Hob. I had. I call I called back to Bally de Hub some eleven years later. I was called because there was a man at that stage and it was the great Dan Lane himself mentioned it. It was Dan Lane they, they approached and they said to him, We'd like myself to go down there and to there was supposed to be a challenge between me and the great ocean swimmer. The man that swam in the Arctic Ocean, he swam in the Black Sea, he swam he swam all over the world and he was a huge man. He was uh, at least about uh, 20, well, a good five stone heavier than myself and a bigger man altogether, like a, a 
big strong. But he was a shy man. He couldn't go before a camera. He would, he he break down and nearly cry. So uh, I'd seen that because I'd watched the, uh, the stories about him. But uh, when I arrived anyway to do that, this is this was number two in Ryland after eleven years. I went on the stage and I pumped out twenty one lifts, and I could think of no other way of. Then I to talk to the audience and first time in my life and all the shows I've done, I've done them in London, all over the place. I even put on shows in front of a half a million people at one stage. So I was well able to handle people. So I said, uh, is John Hayes here? I said, from Ireland, our uh, Munsters rugby team. John Hayes being a tip man like myself. He, um, of course, Mick come in then, the great uh, Mick the Yank, and he said, yes, he said, and Con, Con he said, would, if John was here, he would, he would surely try. He said, but John Hayes, unfortunately, isn't here tonight. So that was the only name I could think of. Not out of any malice for John Hayes, because I really respect John Hayes. He's one hell of a guy, and he's the guy that shed tears when um, when when they went to Croke Park to do the thing. And of course it's no wonder a tip man would shed tears because the last time the British were in uh, Croke Park, we all know what happened. A tip man got shot, uh, John Hogan. Uh, he was a, a footballer. So thank you and thank you for listening to me. I have no props today, no pictures, no nothing. It's just uh, a tribute and a time to tell about Adelta. Other than that, what I have to say is that John Crowley and John, John Crowley and um, Dan, Dan Lane and Mick the Yank are two, three great friends. They went to school together and they're still together today, all them years, and they're all in their 70s now. And good luck. <laughs>